Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. I don't know if you know this or not, but yesterday Suntup released, announced, uh, made available to the public pre-orders for their limited edition of Jaws. <clears throat> well, I do a countdown every month or every new release on uh, the Fans of Suntup Facebook page. And <clears throat> I usually interview one of the creators behind the work. And this time I had the insane honor of interviewing Wendy Benchley, uh, the, the wife of Peter Benchley, um, who wrote Jaws. So, and she wrote the introduction for the Suntup edition. And uh, I haven't read it yet. I don't know anything about it. But I read the book ahead of the interview. I interviewed Wendy. It was awesome. Such a pleasant uh, interview. Such a great woman um, who's still very active in conservation efforts um, to minimize the damage that people do to the oceans via shark fin soup, uh, harvesting, etc., etc., and so on. She says it much better than I could. I'm just the guy that asks the questions. And if the interview is good and you like it, all the credit goes to Wendy Benchley. So check it out. Uh, again, this originally appeared, and if you want to see these live, these interviews live, where you can actually put your questions into the mix, then you join the Fans of Suntup Facebook page. Um, and every new release, I do the countdown, and I do uh, a live interview. Hopefully, it'll continue. I don't know. Sometimes we try to line people up, and it, it just falls through. Um, but in this case, I interviewed Wendy Benchley and John Anthony D. Giovanni, who did the art. I'll, I'll be posting that interview separately. But anyway, hope you enjoyed the interview. Um, check out the book. Even if you can't get the Suntup edition, it's all sold out. It's all buttoned up. The lettered, numbered, Roman, and artist are all accounted for, basically. You, you could get in the lottery for the numbered edition today. Um, no later than tomorrow if you want one. It is one of the most exquisite uh, Suntup editions that um, uh, has, has been released to date. It really is a beautiful thing. So check it out. Uh, check out the interview. And, um, you know, stay frosty. Uh, for once, I'm not talking to myself. It's time to go beyond the book and get over your shell. Hello, Wendy. Yeah, okay. Not yet. There you are. I'm letting you in. Thank you so much for hanging in there, Wendy. Um, I'm going to let you in right now. All right, so I'm going to hang up on this so you don't have feedback. Okay. Awesome. Oh, oh so sorry. Oh, no, don't be. It was not just one click. It was answer questions, do a this, that, and the other thing. So why did Peter write Jaws? <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. Yes, yes, we can hack around. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean it it is confusing. You you have to give your you have to give Messenger all sorts of permissions. Yeah. Hopefully you didn't enter your social security number. No, that no. would be a bridge too far. <laughs> but no, uh, no, it did not. <laughs> so thank you so much for making time. I know there's a lot of great energy in the group today. There's a lot of huge buzz about this book. I refer to you as cultural royalty. I don't know if you want to add that to your uh, your LinkedIn page, but I totally think you are cultural royalty. Um, as a kid of the '70s, we I was affected by this book. We all were, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah so, I was too. Yeah, <laughs> and that's and that's exactly why I'm so thrilled to have you here. You were you were you were riding shotgun for this incredible. Uh, work. I just finished the book today. I absolutely loved it. So um, I just, I, I, there's, there's all, all the words are trying to come out one little door in my brain, which is small as it is. So they're all, they're all getting stuffed up. So let's just start out with, um, I got, as you can see, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> questions. Okay. So what was your initial reaction when you were approached to, to do this fine edition of, of Jaws? Of like, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I was, I, I was thrilled and, um, and truly honored. I mean, I thought it was just great that Jaws is considered enough of a collector's item that Paul was 
wanting to to do these deluxe editions and I can't wait to see them. And I love, I just love the illustrations by, by John. Um, they, I think they're just fabulous. Yeah, I I was going to ask you that too because I, I did talk to John yesterday and he said you you saw them and yeah I was blown away. Um, yeah. I, and I'll post an interview right after this uh, of a chat I had with John. My daughter said it was very short because it was only a half hour. So, um, uh -huh. but it was good. It was packed with information. Um, but yeah, I I was talking to the other admin Chris a little bit ago and 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 we were both kind of like thinking yeah it's a major oversight that it hasn't seen a limited edition or a fine press edition because like without even trying i have a a, a uh, mug uh -huh. a, the, i have two paperbacks i mean it's such a huge it's again a huge impact and nobody's done a limited of it yeah. before yeah so i'm thrilled i'm so pleased yeah and and, and thank you <laughs> oh yeah i mean you know, it's like Suntup has done um, um, such a number of books that have had that cultural impact, like The Exorcist, yeah. Rosemary's Baby, Misery. And, you know, Jaws is right up there. It totally, when I thought about the selection, I'm like, that just totally fits it with, with that other lineup. And so what do you think, why do you think it's had such uh, incredible cultural impact? Well, I, I, you know, I think that uh, we all love and are fascinated by our monsters. Um, and uh, so I think Peter, you know, Peter's concept for the book was brought about by fishing off of Nantucket in the 50s and 60s with his father when there were so many sharks in the water that you couldn't even get your bait out without wow. sharks nibbling. Yeah, so he was writing speeches for Johnson and then Johnson didn't run for office. So Peter did some freelance work, not enough money in freelance work, magazine writing. And he had this idea um, because he had seen sharks before. He was fascinated. Wow. He did a lot of research. And um, so um, I think the book you know, had an impact because honestly, um, sharks were not thought about too much and the ocean was not on people's radar. We thought the ocean was so vast that we could never do anything to change it or harm it. And, um, mm -hmm. and of course, we know better now. But, um, but the book had a great plot. Peter was a really imaginative. Uh, as I say, he did a lot of research. He was very curious about people. Um, he, I think he painted a very real, uh, realistic picture of what life is like at, for a summer community where they depend upon their beaches to be open. Right. And he, this was Nantucket to him, which is where he went as mm -hmm. a child. Um, and so they need their beaches open and their hotels going uh, because people make most of their money during the summer months. So anyway, the book, I think, was exciting and fun. And then, of course, Steven Spielberg um, honed it into a really dramatic, terrific movie. So, the, the so lucky us, you know, lucky the, us. We, we yeah. Were, we were thrilled. Yeah, it was we were not first... thrilled at the reaction, though. No, no, I can imagine. Right. You know, I mean, it was the first summer blockbuster. I mean, yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's insane because, again, growing up, I always thought there was a summer blockbuster. But, yeah, it, it, it really showed yeah. that you can get people to the theater in the summer. But, right, so you are very active in conservation efforts and, um, and with the focus on the ocean, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the sensationalism of the movie right. brought attention to it. But do you feel like those are the created headwinds that you had to batter against? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, it did. And, um, I mean, we, we were just horrified uh, at the reaction to the movie. I mean, this was fiction, everybody. This right. was fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> But people took it as real. And, and just one little sidelight, um, Peter, when he wrote the book, he made the shark a realistic 15, 16 foot. But that's a big, great white shark. Yeah. And, and Spielberg made the shark in the movie 25 feet. So, um, so it truly exaggerated the size of the shark. And also, um, 
Spielberg did make it a malevolent shark. And honestly, Peter wrote the book as uh, it was just a shark doing what sharks do. They are born, they eat, they die. And if they take a bite, they're testing to see. Right. Um, you know, and they don't have malevolent intent and they're not going to come back. So um, so they, they very often bite and then go away. Of course, that bite can be damaging to some Devastating, right. But in any case, we, um, you know, we were really upset that people felt that somehow sharks were these creatures that needed to be killed. And I think there was an uptick in um, shark tournaments, et cetera, mm. and that kind of thing. So we, we very quickly saw that reaction. We also saw many, many dead sharks that have been finned for shark fin soup. So we got right into ocean expeditions, ocean conservation, and uh, you know, have done everything we could. I mean, Peter worked as hard as he could for the last thirty years of his life, um, trying to make a difference. And I worked with him, and you know, I've I've continued, and it's fascinating work. And we're making some headway. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think there's there's not a person growing up today that doesn't understand um, everything yeah. down to the straws we drink from. Can, right. can end up as a hazard. I think everybody's had their heart broken by hearing the stories of whales with 80 pounds of oh. plastic in their gut. Oh, and it's yeah, brutal. it's awful. Um, but to Peter's credit, he, he, he almost uh, predicted that. Um, because in the book, you have that family from Queens that came down because they want to see a shark. You know, yeah. They read about it in the paper and they want to see that shark. So he knew in some way that there's going to be a segment, maybe perhaps didn't realize that segment would be so huge, of people who would be drawn by this gladiator type of battle of good and evil yeah. when it's really just the natural world. Yeah. Um, and he well, made it so believable that people probably had a hard time just drawing that line that this is just fiction. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. I, I think you're, you know, that's, I think that's a very nice compliment because I think his, uh, the, the detail he put in the book, you know, is is very convincing. And heck, I mean, we know now there are a lot of great white sharks coming down because the seals um, are populating off the Cape. So yeah. um, so we've got a lot of real action out there. And um, it's, a, it's a, a great thing to see because the attitude about the sharks now is so different than 40 years ago. People understand they're apex predators, that they're important for the balance in the, in the ocean. And um, Actually, um, the, the White Shark Conservancy was created and people there on the Cape are very interested in shark and shark um, biology and history and they have shark tours now to go out and see them. Um, so it's a, it's a different thing. And they do swim carefully. You, you, you do have to be careful. It's their ocean. Uh, you know, we're going into their space. No doubt. So we've got to be smart about it. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, and that's one thing I was struck with, uh, too, reading the book, is that it didn't feel sensational. It, it really uh, felt like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it really, I, I, I thought it was brilliant in the sense of when I sat and I thought about it, I'm like, okay, a shark is the easiest thing to avoid. <laughs> I've avoided yes. my sharks all my life living in Chicago. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it, you just don't go in the water. I'm like, how do you make it where people have to go in the water? So politics in this 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 tension of the economy and this this yeah. all these people all these forces there's so many forces that brody's right in the middle of pushing mm -hmm. and pulling and um it, it really does not feel over the top I, i'm like wow i can see this happening but as as far as uh uh understanding that i don't think it would get to that point nowadays but you know, the, the reality of a shark just parking itself off a coastal community is unlikely. But even the book says that, you know, this is yeah, not yeah. likely to happen. Yeah. Well, um, when Peter was writing the book, there, uh, the research he did uh, was there was a theory called the rogue shark theory. And that was that if uh, a shark tasted human flesh, well, then it would be completely addicted to the human <laughs> flesh. And so Peter did not go along with that theory. He said, no, no, no. He said, I, you know, shark is just an animal. It's looking for food. 
and it would not have malevolent intent. So that's how, how he wrote the book. And um, so many of the characters, I think, in the book uh, related to his life. I mean, I think he always wanted to be Hooper. Uh, yeah. He would have loved to have been a scientist. And he got so many letters after Jaws from people all over the world saying, oh, you know, Jaws has really turned me on to sharks and to science and I want to be wow. a marine biologist and I understand I can go out on the ocean. I don't have to be in a lab coat and stuck in a lab all day. So I think he, he is, uh, would have loved to have been Hooper. And, um, and then of course, Quint was this absolutely fabulous character that I think was very much fashioned after a man named Teddy Tucker in Bermuda, who oh. was an explorer, um, uh, a ship, he, he uncovered shipwrecks all around Bermuda and was just a really fabulous, bright, diamond in the rough kind of guy. Um, he was wonderful. Anyway, so, um, so many of the characters, obviously not precise, but um, Peter was very, I think, very perceptive and adept at getting to know people very deeply and then, then creating composite characters and making them come alive. You know, <laughs> I, you know, reading reading it. If had I read it uh, as a as a younger, more impressionable lad, I could see how people would be fascinated about marine biology after it because it 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 definitely does not feel like a throwaway. Uh, you could you could you could sense the research. You could sense the the depth of study that went into the book because. You, you felt like you were getting a education just like Brody. Brody was yeah. us, you know, we're, he, we're the stand in yeah. for Brody. And, and he's brought into this world. He doesn't feel comfortable on the water and he meets Quint and, you know, th there's just this, Ed Hooper, and, and there's just this, uh, this education that takes place in a, in a way that doesn't obviously stop the, um, the, the drama, the plot, but in a way brings you into a world that, is 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 fascinating and you see the shark from many angles you see you see the shark yeah. is from this yeah. almost this moby dick dynamic with quint and with yeah. this love affair with hooper and and with this fear from brody um it can be many things and many people and i i think that's what i i like most about it oh well that that's very good to hear i mean certainly peter peter was always very pleased with the fact that the first three pages of the book um, there never was a word changed um, oh. through any of the rewrites because, and that was that, that those pages are describing the shark coming through the water. And um, on many of the dive trips we've done, actually, uh, actually, Peter asked me what I'd like to do for our 40th wedding anniversary. And I said, I'll tell you what, honey, I really would like to go see great white sharks um, off Guadalupe Island. So we, uh, we went out there and uh, for me, it was just wonderful. Cause of course, by then Peter had done much more diving with great whites, but I was usually the last person in the cage, but this time I could be the first person in the cage and <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they are, they are so, <clears throat> so magnificent when you're in the water with them. <clears throat> So you're in a cage, you know, dangling just below the surface and they come by you like just beautiful sleek torpedoes. They barely move their fins. And a couple of times I was able to reach out and, and stroke one from, from head to tail. Wow. And it's very soft, like soft leather. And if you go back the other way, it's, it's like sandpaper. The denticles in the skin are very rough. And, and sometimes we had three or four just cruising around the cage. Um, and they, they're, they're just magnificent animals. So, um, so actually Peter's first experience with a great white was right after the book was written, just before the movie came out and American sportsmen asked him to go down to South Australia to Dangerous Reef to swim with the great whites. Now this was, well, almost 50 years ago, mm. uh, really primitive, early diving with, with sharks. 
uh, it was after Blue Water, White Death. So we had seen that movie. But anyway, the, the boat, uh, we were with Rodney Fox and there was half a horse hung on the stern of the boat because um, that's what they used for bait then. So it was really grungy. Um, it was Australia in the 70s and women were really not welcomed on boats. So I was, I was put to the second deck um, just as an observer. Oh Peter got into the cage and there was a beautiful, big, fat female. You know, the females are bigger than the males. And she was cruising around. So uh, the cameraman was in another cage ready to take film. And the shark came up to take a bite of the horse. And the, the line that attached the cage to the stern of the boat got caught in between the shark's teeth. So she didn't bite through the rope. It just got caught. So she was hooked. And she was furious. So she flapped around and up and down and back and forth. Peter's cage went under the boat, came back up again. I yelled from the upper deck and said, get the rope out of the shark's mouth. But of course the cameramen are so intent on the picture and they don't realize anything's wrong. They think this is great action, right? So I <laughs> oh my, gosh. my way down from the, from the top of the deck. And, um, and when the shark came up again and opened her mouth, I grabbed the line and yanked as hard as I could. The, the line came out, shark was peaceful, everything was fine. Peter stayed down for an hour, had a great, a great dive and was in <laughs> awe of the shark. And he came up at the end and said, what was all that commotion? And anyway, people told him and I was the heroine of the day. Wow, wow. So he didn't yeah, even realize was he was in danger? Yo, yeah, well, I knew, but they didn't. Well, because, you know, they yeah. it was new for them too. They wow. didn't know. But I certainly could see that line in the, wow. in the shark's mouth. You know, so so that was our first experience with great whites. And um, and if ever there was an experience to let you know that they are, are really awesome and, and magnificent creatures and so strong, and boy, do we need them. Now, I just want to say one quick thing, that it's not the fishing for sharks um, that are doing them in. It's the shark finning for shark fin soup in China. And just for your readers to understand, there are at least 100 million sharks killed every year mainly for shark fin soup. So I have been working with a group called Wild Aid and wow. we've made some good progress and brought the demand for shark fin soup down about 80%. So, but there's still a lot of work to do. So wow. anybody who wants to support any ocean conservation group, just go ahead and do it. We need all the help we can get. So do they kill these creatures just for the fins and discard the carcass then and yeah they they cut off of a live shark it's really oh. brutal they cut the fin off oh and then they throw the live animal back to die this slow death and they 80 100 million so you it's just massive to wow. think of the slaughter going on in the oceans yeah that's brutal that is br and we, yeah Oh we really God. need sharks, you know, to keep that balance, balance in the ocean. Oh, for so, sure. You take out the apex yeah. predator and yeah. that whole food chain goes yeah. awry. Wow. Right, right. You know, what's interesting is, is this book uh, opened a lot of eyes, but it also sounds like it opened your and Peter's eyes to like, oh, yes. it's like you were already aware of it. He had this affinity for fishing and, and this fascination with sharks, but at the base of it, a respect for the animal. Yeah. But it yeah. really led to more uh, engagement from right. the both of you. Yes, so, so after Jaws, um, Peter and I went on many expeditions around the world for National Geographic and for other organizations and met, oh, just wonderful scientists and researchers. And we, we saw what was happening to the ocean. And I had, um, I was on the board of the Environmental Defense Fund. Peter became a spokesperson for EDF and also did work with Wild Aid, which is this group I was talking about with the shark finning. And so, um, so we've been, you know, we were just deeply involved and he continued to write um, articles and he did lots of movies, you know, he did documentaries mm -hmm. about the ocean, mm -hmm. um, about sharks and about all creatures in the ocean for the New England Aquarium and for other other groups. So um, 
I, you know, I, th I think his uh, legacy is certainly as a writer, but also as a really passionate, um, effective ocean conservationist and, and a shark conservationist. So I, I, I hope, and I do think that through the years, there's a completely different attitude now about sharks. I mean, when I go and introduce the movie, it's all families out there, you know, they're all with grandchildren and grandparents and they, um, people use it to just be entertained and then to go back and do research on sharks and, and. Yeah, I mean, I, I think seeing the movie and like I said, I, I, I hadn't seen it in years, but uh, seeing the movie yeah. uh, is, I think people understand you only have a certain amount of time. You don't really go deep and it's going to be sensational. You know, it's going to be right. visually, right. you know, uh, stunning and, you know, all that stuff. But I think people who read the book in 74 read it differently. And I think people that read this book yeah. now and, and the exposure Sun Tup will bring to this book again, um, not that it needed it. It spent like what forever at the bestseller list, but I yeah. think the people who read it now will read it so differently. They'll read it more like I did. Um, yeah. yeah. With this sense of curiosity and wonder and awe. I think there's a difference between awesome and awful, but there, there's at the heart this awe for this immense creature. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's a beautiful study of, of, yeah. of man trying to grapple with no longer being this elitist at the top of the food chain. Like <laughs> suddenly yeah, you're, you're without your technology, you're without your advantages, you're in the water, you're yeah. out of your element. Yeah, yeah, very good point, very good point. Yeah, Peter would be pleased to hear you saying those things. Oh, good, because, good. Yeah, he was a fine, you know, really a, a great writer, but as you as you know, because of all of his other books, he he did love strong plot lines. Yeah. And he liked to read books with strong plot lines and good characterization and and based on I mean, almost every single book he did uh, is based on some research or some life experience he had, whether it's the, the deep uh, with the ampules on a boat that was Bermuda and we had been diving on a boat with ampules that were, was a medicine ship. Wow. That went down, yeah, and and those ampules did have morphine in them, <gasps> and so Peter based that whole book on all of that research that that he did down in Bermuda, um, with wrecks around Bermuda, and um, and then he did a, a a book about a giant squid, Architeuthis, <laughs> and we went out on many expeditions <laughs> trying to catch a giant squid. <laughs> if ever there was a fool's errand, that yeah. Was there. Um, so he, so uh, all of his books, I think, um, are connected to life experiences that he had. And as he always said, he was so lucky that, well, that Jaws was successful because it allowed him to get out of his little room up on the third floor, tap, tap, tapping away, you know, yeah. knowing what's going to come out and, um, and be out on the ocean and to really have an exciting exciting life that way so so we always felt very fortunate what a wonderful life i mean really it oh. it's, it's amazing to have that art inspire the life inspire the art you know that that it it, it comes full circle and um yeah. I, I was curious after reading the book about peter's other works um i know there's one and of course having you on the call with no uh, note about it i'm blanking on the name it was the girl from something it has a big oh the girl of the sea of cortez yeah the girl of the sea of cortez so that um i'm so glad you brought that up because that was his favorite book i think it was wow. really his love letter to the ocean and to the creatures in the ocean and i'll just tell you a quick little story about how that book came about he was with the american sportsman in the girl uh, uh, in the sea of cortez doing a shoot with hammerhead sharks and um and michelle hall was left on the boat she is of the team howard and michelle hall movie productions really top but anyway this was years ago 30 years ago and she looked she was alone on the boat she looked over and saw the shadow under the boat she put on a tank, went down. It was a beautiful, huge manta ray. 
Now, uh, your readers may not know, but manta rays can, they do not sting, first of all. They're very, very gentle creatures and they just eat microscopic um, food, but they can have a wingspan of 15, 16 feet. They're, oh, beautiful, just gorgeous. And so she rested on the back and she saw that the um, fishing line had been caught in its flesh Ooh. and was ripping the flesh. So she very gingerly came up on its back and pulled the fishing line out and it shuddered, but it never flipped her off. I mean, they're very powerful. This manta could have flipped her off anytime he wanted. And she packed the flesh back in and then she just rested on his back and held the upper lip and the manta swam through the water and gave her a ride for like 10 minutes brought her back to the boat, no. came up on the boat. <laughs> Peter came back from the hammerhead shark shoot and Michelle said, Peter, look below, there is this gorgeous manta. And I just got the fishing line out and Peter put on a tank, went down, the manta gave him a ride. The manta stayed <laughs> with them for three days. Wow. And obviously knew that it so, so the manta was healing right from the wound in its shoulder, but it obviously knew that these people were not going to hurt it. It never flipped anybody off. So Peter was so excited by what this an experience. encounter that he came back and he wrote the girl of the sea of Cortez um, about a, a young Mexican girl and her relationship to a manta ray. And it's, it's again, has a very strong plot. It, it distresses me no end, this book, because her brother tries to um, go after the manta and kill it. And, and you know, so there's there's huh. good, there's good strong plot in it and good character development. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful book. And there, there are a couple of people who are trying to make a movie. So I hope it happens. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it'd be fun. I hadn't right. read that. I, ju- I just saw that, you know, I'm always attracted to the books that get cult followings. Um, you can't exactly call this book a cult following because it's such a huge appeal. A cult has to be a small, you know, a little group that oh, yeah, yeah, are, are yeah. that love a work. But um, <clears throat> um, but that always pulls my eye because I always like to go for what the real fans are going for. But um, yeah, after reading the book and 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 loving it, I mean, um, okay, so so uh, we have a. a we can turn to some questions. Uh, my producer is showing me some questions from the group. Since I'm talking to you, I can't. I can't really watch yeah, it. Yeah. But, um, uh, a friend of ours named Blue is saying, "Is what? What are some good conservation groups to support?" Oh gosh. Oh well, you know, I I would just find if you're interested in really doing something active, then I would find your your local conservation group. So. If, you know, there are ones all over the, the country. But um, Wild Aid is one who's based in San Francisco, and they are really doing the, I think, the best job when it comes to shark finning. Um, they, I, I won't go into too much detail, but they basically have icons like Jackie Chan or Yao Ming or Maggie Q, that, and they do absolutely superb, very humorous, very um, powerful uh, minute or three minute spots that are on Chinese um, television. And that um, they've educated the whole middle class of Chinese about what shark fin soup is made of. It's made of a fin and it kills the shark, which wow. people don't really understand. So I think Wild Aid is excellent. Um, I'm, I also do a lot of work with Environmental Defense Fund, Conservation International. Um, I. I love Beneath the Waves, which is a new group um, I'm working with because they are doing a lot of work in the Caribbean, um, the Bahamas with sharks, tagging sharks, and also helping to create a large marine protected areas down there. Um, so that's, that's, our, that's what I think most people feel is our most important way to keep the ocean healthy or to bring it back to health is to cope with overfishing, but also have enough marine protected areas where the ocean can revive and restore itself and fish can grow from little tiny fish to great big fish. And then when they swim out of the marine protected area, 
you've got much bigger fish to catch, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, um, but that's beneath the waves. Uh, gosh, I mean, I, so many really good. The Nature Conservancy is good. Um, NRDC is good. Oceana is wonderful. The Ocean Conservancy, truly. I, I, I just think everybody is working on these issues and we're all banding together to try to push us over the top here. We need to get, we really need to get 30% of the ocean protected mm -hmm. by 2030 in order to have enough biomass created in the ocean to keep it healthy and to feed human beings. Yeah. So just do whatever you can, you all. Any group is great. Just get out there, do it part time, full time, just on the weekends, anytime. Yeah. No. Um, Give money too. Give money, whatever you can. Yeah, I think um, you know it's 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 great. I and I'm I'm encouraged by the the messages we're getting um, asking for this. And I would say to Blue. Um, this video is recorded, so I think you can see these um, this list of uh, agencies and organizations right. back. So, but um, Blue was wondering if he could get a list. He yeah. he'd love to see that. Yeah. Um, well, I could I could post a list on your Facebook page sometime. Oh, great! Is that all right? Oh yeah, no. If if you if you because now you're in the fans group, so if you wanted to create a post yeah. with um agencies that you're aware of that they use their money for you know that they're they're most effective the the ones you endorse great you know i think okay. people would love that um okay so, great so that's we'll awesome do. yeah i think you know yeah. it i think um you know especially after people read the book and i yeah again like i said reading the book now compared to you know 40 years ago yeah. Is a different take on it, um, and and I think we all understand the, the ocean's role in in uh, reducing carbon and producing oxygen and keeping yep. all of us sustained. Um, I think mm -hmm. we have, and but the the shark fin soup that's a harder thing because it's 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 cultural, you know, it's a it's in, embedded in some of the culture where they just yep. have this tradition of yeah, but you know, people change their culture. Oh, the sure, Chinese, yeah. And, and they've been really superb at changing their culture. So um, the, the, the demand for shark fin soup, as I say, is down 80%. So I think That's amazing. What we, we owe the world to really get the world to understand uh, what is happening in the ocean. And, and most people want to be good citizens, you know? For um, sure. I mean, yeah. it's just one yeah. planet. I mean, you know, yeah. we only get one uh, one big marble in the. One chance in the, at it here. Yeah. So, exactly. um, well, we're at time. We're we're at we're at uh, we've been an hour here. Um, I cannot thank you enough. I think um, it, it's amazing that you had the time to do this. Uh, and, uh, and hardly, I, I'm I'm very pleased to do it. Oh, you it's know, thrilling. I mean, well, I tell you, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I did interrupt you because <laughs> I think um, <laughs> I think it's just great that Suntop is republishing Jaws uh, because I do think the book really holds up well. It's it's good writing, and also people, I'm so pleased that people are interested in sharks, ocean conservation work, and so as you say, there is information in the in the book too you feel like you're getting an education as you're getting a little bit of a thrill oh for sure i mean <laughs> it's, a, it's a world um i hadn't been part of you know um and yeah. you know it's yeah it's it's definitely something that you you do <laughs> you do like again you get multiple perspectives of this this one animal randomly encounters this community and it sends everything into a tailspin so it's it's amazing how all these different people could approach the animal and it's, I, I don't know. I really love the book. Um, and I'm thrilled. I don't often read like, uh, sometimes I don't read the book before Suntup publishes it. Cause I want to read it as a Suntup book. But, um, but I had to do this one cause I knew I was talking to you and, and I, I wanted to have a, a informed opinion on the book and I'm pumped for it. I think it's, I, I couldn't be happier. So, uh, 
you know, and having your insight and then talking to the artist is is really something that I think adds a, a, a level of insight into this that everybody could appreciate. So I know I speak for everybody that's watching now that uh, we, we can't thank you enough for, oh, for letting us know. You're about welcome. I thank you. And I thank Paul Suntop and John for the gorgeous, stunning illustrations. And they uh, are. I thank all the, all the Jaws fans who, who really are out there interested in caring about sharks. So thanks for that. Well, I'm delighted. It's been delightful. Uh, stick around the group and see the reaction and post your list of agencies. And I think uh, there's a lot of great energy today and um, it is safe to go back in the water. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 <laughs>